Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop from Washington. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live actually from my home across the river in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, remember me? Uh, I'm back. <laughs> I did my last show in December 2018, and then I went off to serve. Uh, most of you know I am a delegate in the Virginia House of Delegates. Um, that's what we call representatives in Virginia. You're like, well, Mark, why don't you call them representatives? Because we're older than the United States. The House of Delegates actually is 400 years old this year in 2019. It is the oldest elected government in the Western Hemisphere, the end in 1619, and we predate the United States by 170 years or so. So before they called them representatives, they called them delegates. Actually, before that, Burgesses. And if you're like, why, Mark, are you going on this wild tangent? Because that's me, and you know me, and that's why you're listening to my show. I'm all about wild historical tangents. In any case, I went to serve in the Virginia General Assembly, did our session in 2019. We're almost done. We actually have our last day tomorrow uh, where we go back in and decide what to do uh, about the governor's uh, votes and vetoes and uh, amendments. And I'll give you some insight into what we do in Virginia probably next week or the week thereafter. Uh, but can't really talk about what's going to happen tomorrow yet because it hasn't happened. Um, so I want to talk about philosophy, political philosophy. I like to begin the year in a philosophical mood. We will get to all the specifics of everything going on in the world in the craziness that's in the White House. We'll get, we'll get to all of that, I promise. But I was thinking about what makes a liberal and what makes a conservative. What is it about the way we wake up in the morning, the way we approach people? What is it about who we are? Because all too often, it's very hard to persuade people using logic. A lot of it's based on emotion. And I think at the heart, at the core, of who a liberal is and who a conservative is, is how we approach strangers, people we've never met before. When you see a stranger, it's your first thought, huh, what an interesting person. Look at the way they do this. Look at the way they're dressed. Look at the way they act. I wonder what it's like to be like them. Um, wonder what they're doing here. Um, you know, uh, how, how are they? Wonder if their life's going well, you know? like to chat with them, get to know them. They're probably a good person, probably fun person. What makes them tick? If that's the way you approach a stranger, you're, you're probably a liberal. Now, what if you see a stranger and you think, um, where's my wallet? Okay. All right. He hasn't grabbed it. Um, oh, wait. Um, he, he might step on my toes. Oh, ah, not sure about giving him money. He might try to cheat me. Um, you know, he probably doesn't like me. Uh, he's really, he, yeah, he looks kind of sketchy. Uh, I'm going to keep my distance. I don't really want to talk to him. Um, I don't like to talk to strangers. My mama taught me not to talk to strangers. He's probably dangerous or at least not a very pleasant person. If that's your first thought on meeting a complete stranger, you're probably a conservative. I think the main difference between a liberal and conservative is this basic core axiom of whether you basically trust someone you've never met before or you fear someone you've never met before. And if you fear someone of a different fill in the blank, a different race, a different ethnicity, a different religion, a different gender, a different sexual orientation, a different age. Oh, you know, old people, I don't know. Oh, oh, you know, young people, oh, kids today. If you fear based on a certain characteristic that people don't control, oh, um, that person appears to be disabled. That's kind of weird. Oh, that person is really large and imposing. That's kind of scary. Oh, that person um, looks a little um, like they've got a, a scar on their face. I don't know about that. If someone is, looks different from you and that makes you fear them, you're probably conservative. Now, if that difference makes you more interested, oh, wow, I've never met a Sikh before. I really don't know that much about Sikhs. Aren't they the ones that wear the turbans? I wonder why they wear the turbans. I wonder if that person would mind if I ask. I kind of want to ask, hey, what's the religious significance of the turban? And you actually are curious, 
and you feel like they'll probably answer the question and appreciate that you asked and, it, and love telling you something about who they are, <laughs> you're probably a liberal. Now, all our parents teach us as we're growing up, whether to love or fear, strangers. And note that I say strangers. It's easy to love or fear your family or your friends. We choose our friends. And our colleagues, well, we have to work with them. We know them. And listen, I'm not saying trust everyone. I'm a good liberal. I don't trust everyone. Certainly not saying fear everyone. It just all goes to me have to do with that default, that default mechanism. Oh, yeah, that's probably a good person. Seems like a nice person. Oh, you know, that person seems a little sketchy. I'm going to avoid that person. How do you approach strangers? You know, I've only been a politician for four years. And I genuinely like most people. I meet hundreds. I've met thousands of people since I've been a politician. Actually, the worst part is that I often don't remember people's names. Sorry, folks. When I say, hey, how are you? I'm giving away all my secrets. I'm really mean. I recognize you, but I don't remember your name. I represent 85,000 people. I don't remember all their names. Plus, I, I live in an urban area, so there's lots of people I don't represent whose names I should remember. But I am – so while it's not genuine that I don't remember their name and I'm a little embarrassed about that, it is genuine that I'm usually happy to see the vast majority of people. But there are people I don't trust. There are people I don't like to see. There are people who I reached out to and slapped me back and did mean unfair things to me. Yeah, I hold a grudge. I remember. But only to the people that have done something that I consider to be dishonest or an attack on me or showing a lack of integrity or something rude. I give people the benefit of the doubt. Do you? Do you give people the benefit of the doubt? Or do you distrust until proven trustworthy? Is your default, I don't really trust you. I'm not really going to talk to you unless you prove to me you're a nice person. Or is your default, I'm going to assume you're a nice person unless you prove to me you're not. As I think about all the uh, xenophobia, all the, all the fear of foreigners, all the fear of immigrants that the Republican Party has right now, well, that's a lot of what I'm thinking. Oh, well, those people that look differently from me or speak a different language or are poor. Are you afraid of poor people? <laughs> You're probably a Republican. Heck, Republicans could be poor and be afraid of poor people. Why should you be afraid of poor people? They're frankly just struggling to get along. A liberal may be more afraid of rich people. Misusing the system, using the system in ways to manipulate it to get unjust answers. But at the end of the day, I think a true person of compassion, you, there are good people that are rich and bad people that are rich. There are good people that are poor and bad people that are poor. It's all about judging based on the person themselves. So when I look at Fox News, and you know I go on Fox News, it's always the fear. It's always the, oh, my God, the migrants, they're invading. They're going to come after us. And what are they going to do? Who are the migrants? Donald Trump just recently shut down um, aid to some really struggling Central American countries, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. Fox reported that Donald Trump shut down aid to three Mexican countries, apparently not understanding that Mexico is a country and it's not those three countries. But I get it. I get it. All Spanish, all Latinos, they all look alike. That's what prejudice is. It's prejudice. It's ignorance. It's fear. It's misunderstanding. What are the immigrants that come to America any different from you or me or our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our great-great-grandparents. If anything, the people who came to America, the white people that came from England 400 years ago, landing where Native Americans were, taking their land, largely, not largely, almost exclusively mistreating them, they were the unwelcome immigrants, and the Native Americans had reason to fear them. Indeed, they may have made a mistake in being too kind to the first English settlers 400 years ago. Maybe our wonderful holiday of Thanksgiving is all a farce. 
the Native Americans who we ignorantly called Indians because we apparently didn't realize we weren't in India, <laughs> um, who helped feed, uh, feed early Americans and keep them from starving. And those same early Americans repaid the Native Americans by confiscating their land, murdering the vast majority of them, trying to enslave them. And when that slavery failed to work, uh, brought in a bunch of Africans and enslaved them. That's our history. And ironically, think of the irony here. Think what conservative values are. Conservative values go back to those early white people who expropriated the Native Americans' land, who enslaved the Africans. Today, people who are conservatives claim to be Christian. But what is Christianity supposed to be except loving thy neighbor as thyself? Can anyone say that a Trumpist loves his neighbor as himself? Trump doesn't even love himself, much less anyone else. Well, I guess he does love himself, but you know, I don't think he does because he's so insecure. He's so searching for love, probably never got any. But I don't even want to talk about Trump. I want to talk about Trumpists, people who are so insecure that they have to reach out and hate others to feel a sense of worth, to feel a sense of strength. Lyndon Johnson famously said in 1960, and I don't have the exact quote in front of me, so I'm paraphrasing a bit. He said, tell the lowest white man that he's better than the best colored man, and he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Heck, give him someone to look down on, and he'll empty his pockets for you. At the end of the day, isn't that what conservatism is all about? Getting people to fear and hate one another so that they empty their pockets for you. Isn't that what Trumpism is? Trump isn't helping all those people who blindly follow him. He's teaching them to hate and fear so they empty their pockets for him. And that is the heart of today's Republican Party. Don't get me wrong. There are some exceptions. There are people like Jeff Flake, who's no longer in office. John McCain, who's dead. Bob Corker, who's no longer in office. Commenters like George Will, Jennifer Rubin. These are conservatives. These are people I used to disagree with, and I still disagree with on certain matters of policy. But they certainly have enough integrity to put their patriotism, their love of country ahead of the Republican Party. But the reason I can name them on one hand is because there's so few. Because the vast majority of the Republican Party has said, hey, I'll support all the dictatorial, dictatorial powers that I used to rail against as long as Trump helps keep me in power. Tell the lowest white man he's better off than the best colored man. He won't notice you're picking his pockets. Heck, let him look down on someone and he'll empty his pockets for you. Lyndon Johnson said that 60 years ago. It could never be more true than today. This is Mark Levine. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more of the Inside Scoop right after this. Well, hello, Facebook audience. Welcome to this year's Inside Scoop. This is the point where everyone on the radio has to go to commercial break, but um, actually, can we turn off the commercial break, Mark? I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can do that these days. Um, maybe I can do it. Let me see. Let me see if I can do that. There. So Facebook audience, did I turn them off? Did I turn off this background sound? Let me know. It's hard for me to tell. I can't hear them anymore, but I can't always tell what you can hear. 
on Facebook. Um, so um, I'm glad to be back with you folks. Um, want to tell you a little bit about 2019. Um, I have decided to be even less on air than I was before. I'm going down to one a week. That is not, I haven't been fired. This is my choice. Um, I've just frankly spent so much time as delegate that twice, you know, I used to do five days a week. And then I went to three times a week and then two. This year I'm cutting back to one. I almost stopped, almost left radio. Um, but I think once a week may just work for me. The other thing is you may notice I'm not in my studio. I am in my house. Yay, technology. That's great. I get to sit at my desk. That saves me a lot of time and effort going into D.C. I guess I have to change my tag live from Washington, although I don't know that live from Alexandria has quite the same ring to it. Um, but, hey, Washington's just right there. I can't turn my computer around, can I, without messing all this up? Let's see. Look, there's Washington across the river. Can you see it? <laughs> all right. I just ruined everything. Um, but, um, yeah, so talking about philosophy today. And um, I am reading your comments. So, and look at all these people that came in, even though I did no advertising. I thought my first show back, I'd be a little careful and not advertise it. Um, this is kind of the exception. Most of my shows are going to be on Thursday. Uh, and you can't call in today. Uh, let's Okay. So tell me on Facebook, folks, when I turn off the sound, is it off? Oh, oh, people can tell me. I only hear you. Never was on. Oh, really? Hold on. I see. I got to scroll down here. Da, 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 da. Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. It's not my normal studio. Oh, Arthur Bergman, you are not a nice person at all, are you? <laughs> I don't know who you are. I've never heard of you, and I don't know why you – see, Arthur Bergman – Whoever he is, he's a typical conservative, right? Instead of combating my ideas, he just calls names. And I understand that. That's what you do when you have a reptilian brain, you see. All you can do is, is use fear and call people names. It's a shame you haven't graduated to be able to use logic yet, but maybe if you become a liberal, you will learn how to think and not just insult. Hope you do one day. All right, we don't hear it. We can't hear it. Never was on. Oh, D.C. metro area, close enough. What don't you hear? da 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 da, -da. Oh, the commercials. I hear Mark, but not the commercials. Well, that's great. Okay, so I'm going to flip back on the sound that I hear, which is the commercials. And, and you can let me know if you hear it. And if you don't hear it, then it doesn't matter. In fact, I could just remove it from the earphones. But actually, so Mark, one reason why they might not hear the commercials is because um, I turned them down here. And the problem will only be they won't be able to hear callers. So we'll have to practice with that. But um, so can you hear the commercials now, folks? They're talking about Massey Coal Company. Can you hear that? Solid test. First show of the year. Oh, here we go. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about the philosophy of conservatives and liberals. Um, one reason I was thinking about it is that this year, for the first time ever, actually, I have a Republican opponent. That's right. Um, I've been in Democratic primaries before, and those aren't. I mean, I always like the competition of ideas, but those aren't particularly pleasant things for me because when I agree with my opponents 90% of the time and we skirmish over little differences, you know, you know, you get it. It's like people ask me, who do I support in the 2020 Democratic primaries for president? And I say, well, number one, it's way too early. I'm going to take my time. I'm not going to jump on any horse. I'm going to watch the debates. I like virtually all of them. In fact, 80, 90% of them I love, maybe 10% I only like, and all of them are better than Donald Trump. I mean, I would vote for a rabid dog over Donald Trump because I think they would do less harm to, to the nation. You know, plus rabid dogs can be lovable. So, you know, there's that. But um, in a primary race, it's hard. I mean, what the difference between 
uh, Pete Buttigieg and um, and um, Elizabeth Warren and and Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and Joe Biden and they're all great, all of them, all of them. I want them all to be president. <laughs> And so when I run a Democrat primary, it's kind of like that. It's like, well, we agree we have to fight climate change. We agree that the discrimination is wrong. We agree that workers should be paid a fair share of wages. And, you know, we agree, we agree, we agree. But I have a real honest to goodness Republican running against me for the House of Delegates this November. Um, he is a Paul Ryan Republican. He seems like a nice guy, personally. It's just that he wants to, he believes that if we help poor people have food or health care, they won't learn to scavenge on their own. Basic Republican talking point. Let sick people die because how else are they going to learn to work? If you don't make that four-year-old work, you know, what's it doing? Wasting his time, sitting in the crib all day. <laughs> I, it's a lack of compassion. It's a lack of seeing yourself in others. Now, it can go too far. We're going to talk more about, about trust and fear on the back side of the hour. It can go too far. After all, you don't want to trust someone who's taking advantage of you. Conservatives always seem to fear someone's taking advantage of them, but it can happen. You don't want to do that. That makes sense. And on the, there are legitimately people to fear. And conservatives tend to trust people that they know really well. But ask yourself, what kind of human being other than a police officer, security officer, someone whose job it is to keep security. What kind of human being does not feel comfortable unless they have a gun by their side? When we come back, I want to talk about someone who, my constituent, who wanted to visit me, but only with a gun by his side. What does that mean to live life Always worried that the next moment some person is going to start shooting at you. Does that start playing with your mind and who you are as a person? Does that make you love your human being a little less? I think it does. We'll talk more about that after the break. This is Mark Levine, back in five minutes. So there you go. There's a second person that's come on my feed only to insult me. You know, conservatives, can any of you actually think? Do any of you have any ideas? I know there's some. George Will, William F. Buckley, there are intelligent conservatives. I understand that. But they must be really, really, really rare. So Anita Zayas and where's the other guy? Arthur Bergman, why don't you suggest where you think I'm wrong? Why don't you tell me how compassionate conservatives are? Uh, tell me they don't live in hate and fear. Tell me why it's good to carry a gun and fear everyone around you. But when you just insult me, you're kind of proving my point. You're kind of proving my point. I don't hate people who express ideas differently from me. I tend to want to engage them. I want to prove them wrong, sure. But I don't insult them because that doesn't solve any problems. So, you know, <laughs> all you do when you just insult me is you prove that you have no ideas. And that's kind of sad. My guess is Anita and Arthur are gone because, heck, ideas scare them. Logic, thoughts. Yeah, no callers today, Jeremy. There will be callers next week, I promise. So no commercial sound, just me. Riveting analysis. Thank you, Mark. Hey, Patrick, you really should come to the reunion. Patrick's my friend from high school, although I haven't seen him in, I won't say how old I am, some years. <laughs> um, I'm going to my high school reunion. See, I can just talk about things in the break that only Facebook can hear. Uh, I'm going to my high school reunion for, uh, next month in Nashville, Tennessee. So, oh, Robinson, look, what's this? Like, is this a whole USN reunion right here on my Facebook feed? Hi, Robin. Um, so this is the commercial break. I'm getting back to the show in four minutes. And in the commercial break, I feel like I might as well just chat with y'all. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. Oh, Mark, you, you actually stopped the commercial. Good. Oh, no, I turned it down. Oh, yeah, I turned it down. I did. That's interesting, though, because I did hear the music. Not sure how that works. 
Anyway, this is my first show back in 2019. That's why I didn't publicize it because I wanted to work out all the uh, kinks and all. And it's kind of fun doing it from my home, I'll tell you. It's much nicer. It's much more convenient for me. I don't have to go into D.C. and try to find parking, and um, which can be a pain, a pain sometimes. But I still have those studios in case I want to have a, a guest. Um, so that's always nice. <laughs> Ray. Yes, I have friends. I have many friends. I am going to the reunion. Oh, good. Stephanie will be there. Wonderful. That'll be fantastic. What's interesting, Ray, is that the three conservatives who've commented here have only done insults. That's all they can do. Are, do, are there any ideas that conservatives have? When we come back, I'm going to talk about why Republicans want to take away people's health care. Why it's so important. Why suffering, making strangers suffer, is such an important Republican characteristic. But, um, yep, yeah, Ray, you're going to have to do better than insults. You see, I'm not afraid of insults. You're afraid of ideas. I'm not afraid of insults. If you came back with ideas, maybe a Republican health care proposal, that would be interesting. That would be something that we could actually address and discuss. Thoughts on the hands-free cell phone bill? I support it, Tristan. Um, I think that even though, truth be told, full confessions, I cannot deny I have used my cell phone with my hands in my car. But once it becomes a law, I'm going to follow the law. And it's going to get someone like me. I'm a law-abiding person. I'm going to follow the law. And maybe I'm just going to make my life safer and everyone else around me safer. So I'm going to support the bill that's going to make me be a better person, better driver, less likely to cause an accident. So, yes, I do support the hands-free bill, even though I freely admit that's a law that had it been a law, I would have broken in the past. I also have a bit of a speeding record. Should I be confessing all this publicly? <laughs> Maybe my Republican opponent will, will, will find uh, all the times I've gone over the speed limit. I remember when all these Virginia scandals kept forward. I'm like, okay, I've never done blackface. Um, I've never sexually harassed anyone. But I do have my share of speeding. Oh, and parking tickets. I do pay them. I've had my share of parking tickets, particularly if you live around Washington, D.C., and you drive. If you don't have a share of park, your share of parking tickets, how, how do you live? I don't understand that. But um, So that, that's about the worst that I can say. That was just a question, no insults. Yes, Ray, I've got plenty of wonderful friends. Concerns about racial profiling. Um, Tristan, I actually reject those. I'm always concerned about racial profiling, always. And it's a huge concern. And people are stopped for driving while black. My view is that someone who wants to racially profile can do it for almost anything. They can do it for a broken taillight. They can say you were changing lanes without signaling. They can say you were um, going too slow, going too fast. I think people do racial profile and do so for any number of reasons. But I don't think the hands-free cell phone is an extra reason to racial profile. It may be, but it's just a pretext. The point is if someone's racially profiling, it means they're using a pretext. And there's lots of pretexts out there. So I'd rather make the good policy on hands-free cell phones and still try to stop racial profiling. But I guess I don't believe that the new law will add to any racial profiling that isn't already going on. I, it's, it's a terrible thing, but I think the the... I don't believe the amount of racial profiling will increase. It'll still be there. It'll be used as a pretext like everything else, but it's the pretextual racial profiling that's bad, not the hands-free cell law. That's my view, which is why actually I supported it last year, even when some of my colleagues uh, voted against it for fear of racial profiling. Tristan Shields, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is also running for the House of Delegates. I hope he'll come join me uh, and be elected this November. He's got a much tougher district than I do, a rural district. Uh, but, great, Ray, I'm glad to hear you're not insulting. Uh, if you have a comment um, based on something I say and you want to post it, hey, post it. That's, that's part of what this is all about. So welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I am your host, Mark Levine. I guess I turned the sound down. Um, so I didn't hear me come back on the air. Uh, we are back for the year. Um, I'll be on mostly Thursdays, um, every now and then on a different date. 
And I'm glad to be back ch chatting with you. I'm also glad to be back with my friends on Facebook Live. I'm talking about kind of the philosophy of what makes a conservative, what makes a liberal, and thinking about how it is that we approach strangers. Now, we have a very weird gun laws in Virginia. We have very, very... I hesitate to use the word liberal, but let's just say we have two easy gun laws. It's very easy if you're uh, a mass murderer, convicted felon, a terrorist, someone who has brutally abused people, shot people, um, and you're out of prison. It's very, very easy to get a gun. It's not even illegal in Virginia to sell a gun without a background check. You can go to someone and say, uh, I want to buy a gun, no questions asked. You say, aha, here's your gun, no question asked. Um, and that person could be a member of Al-Qaeda and just buy hundreds of guns with tens of thousands of bullets and all perfectly legal in Virginia. It's one of those laws that, frankly, if Democrats take power this November, I'm going to want to change. But one of the things that's really strange and, frankly, probably be our first rules change if the Democrats do take over in November. By the way, uh, whether you live in Virginia or not, it's going to be really exciting this November, not November 2020, this November 2019, because we're the only state in the United States with a chance to change power, to go from Republican to Democratic. We only are two seats short in the Virginia House of Delegates, only one seat short in the Virginia Senate. And if we win those seats, Virginia will have its first progressive majority in 400 years. Really exciting um, to be on the cusp of change in a state that, let's face it, was the capital of the Confederacy not particularly known for progressive change. But one of the first things we'll probably change is we will restrict the use of guns in the visitor's gallery of the House of Delegates. Yes, that's right, and I almost, almost hesitate to say it on the air, but it is true that in the Virginia House of Delegates, people who visit our chamber and sit on the balcony overlooking the session are welcome to, well, I don't know about welcome, but they are free, it is legal, for them to carry guns on their hips. And I'm not talking about police. I'm not talking about sheriffs. I'm not talking about people in the military. I'm talking about your ordinary person. I'm talking about someone who could be a convicted mass murderer out on parole or a member of Al-Qaeda or someone who says death to America. They can bring in their AR-15 or AK-47 and sit there. Now, if they start shooting at us, that's illegal. Murder is still illegal in Virginia but they could kill a bunch of us before security gets to them. Now, why the heck is that legal? It seems really dangerous. And I talked with some of my colleagues. I have lots of friends, sorry, Ray, lots of friends, including Republicans who are in the House of Delegates. And we disagree on lots of things. That doesn't mean they aren't my friends. And I talked to one of them who is a guy that represents very rural Virginia. Um, we drink together. He's a good guy. We disagree on lots of things, but I think he's a good person. And we were, I talked to him about this rule in the House of Delegates. And I said, he said, well, you know, I have my gun there. And I said, I know you do. He's got a gun in his desk. I don't have a gun in my desk. He's got a gun in his desk. But I said to him, and I won't use his first name because it's not about him. I said to him using his first name, um, we'll call him Joe because I don't think there are any Joes in the House of Delegates, not that I can think of right now. But I said Joe, that wasn't his real name. Um, you know that if someone's in the gallery, you can't be watching them all the time. You may have a gun in your desk, but you're not looking at the gallery. You're looking at the bills. You're deciding what to vote on. You're making sure you got the, you know, you don't want to vote the wrong way on a bill. You don't have time to repeatedly scour the gallery, which changes. People go in, they go out. You know, you, you can't watch it all the time or even most of the time. And he said to me, well, Mark, you know, if a crazy guy comes in and starts shooting everybody, uh, they're going to shoot your side of the aisle of the chamber first. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe they'll shoot us Democrats first. It was kind of a sick joke. We had a Bernie Sanders supporter, though, shoot a Republican. So I don't think that the dangers of mentally ill or terrorists or evil people with guns is solely a conservative problem. 
But in that debate, we actually did a rules change. This was last year. We did a rules change to try to say, hey, just like the Virginia Senate, there should be a metal detector. And you can come in and watch, but you can't come in with your gun. Leave it outside. And the Republicans argued strenuously against it. They said, citizens have a right to hold their legislators at gunpoint. Well, they didn't quite say that. But they said that um, that people don't feel comfortable without a gun on their hip. And we should make them feel comfortable. Now, they're in the House of Delegates chamber. They're in a building that's 240 years old, designed by Thomas Jefferson. They're in an august setting. There are police officers there. They don't need a gun to feel safe in that chamber. Think of that level of paranoia. I have a rule, by the way, in my office. You want to come visit me in Richmond? You can't wear a gun in my office. I allow police officers, sheriffs, people who are trained, I, I allow them with guns in my office. But generally, no, I don't allow guns in my office. And if some, I had a constituent want to come chat with me. And he wanted to bring his gun in my office. And I said, no, I don't allow guns in my office. He said, well, I can't talk to you. <laughs> you have to come out here and you have to talk to me because I'm a constituent. You know what? I do want to talk to constituents, but not if they're wearing a gun. What was he going to do? What did he fear? This guy's a head taller than me. I'm sure he's stronger than me. Did he think I was going to, from my desk, start stabbing him with a knife? But that is the conservative mentality. Everyone is to be feared. Everyone is danger. Look around. I once debated the issue of guns in Colorado, and I talked about the fact that you may remember in Colorado, I believe it was Aurora. I, honestly, I get all these mass shootings mixed up because there are so many of them. But do you remember the guy who thought he was in a Batman movie and brought this It's AR-15 and it's always an AR-15. That's the weapon of choice for mass murderers. And he had a hundred bullet drum and he went to the theater and he shot 70 people until his gun malfunctioned. Remember that guy? And I said that we need to not give these military drums of bullets to ordinary citizens with mental problems. And I thought that was an easy thing to sell. And I got, nope, the conservatives disagree with me. They said, nope, we need all those. It takes a second and a half, a second and a half to change bullets. And if I can't hit a deer in 20 shots, I can't let that deer get away in one second. And my thought is if you can't hit a deer in 20 shots, that deer gets a free walk home. It's supposed to be a sport. Anyway, but I said, look, you're in the theater, and it's dark because it's the theater, and you got your popcorn in one hand, you got your, 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 your juju bead is in the, in the other, and, and, and you got your Glock, and you hear the shooting, and everyone's screaming and running, and it's dark, and there's smoke in the air. And somehow, you're going to get through your popcorn, get your Glock out, find the shooter, and not the victim, not some other person standing up, and you're going to get them successfully without shooting someone and this woman. And I said, yeah, I am. First of all, I didn't think she was telling the truth, but she's very proud of herself. But if she was, that's even more scary. If this woman in a movie theater is not watching the movie, is not enjoying herself with her loved one, with her popcorn and her large Diet Coke, and is instead scanning the theater and looking around, paranoid, wondering when one of the patrons is going to get up and start shooting and spends the entire movie looking around, paranoid, then I really fear for that woman. What kind of life does she lead? Who is she? Can you imagine going through life fearing every single person you get on the metro? Maybe that's why rural people are more likely to be conservative. 
they'd be completely frightened of the metro that we in the Washington, D.C. metro area go in all the time. If I look at other people on the metro, and yeah, I'm often looking at my phone, but if I'm looking at other people, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. What's that person wearing? wonder where they're coming from. wonder what, what they're all about. Might smile at someone. If I see a tourist in D.C., they're often lost. They're visiting. Can I help you? Oh, yeah, here's how you get to Stadium Armory. You take, you know, the orange line. I, when you see a stranger in trouble, do you reach out to try to help them? Or do you avoid them because they're trouble? How ironic is it that the people who supposedly most love organized religion act the least like Jesus? How ironic is it that the people who claim to so believe in Christianity do not love their neighbors as thyselves, do fear the stranger, don't act like Abraham bringing in the strangers, treating them well, who turn out to be angels, but want to hide in their bunker, deep underground, bombarded with guns, and they claim to be Christian? Whereas a lot of liberals don't follow organized religion but they're the ones reaching out to help someone in need. Where do your morals lie? Before we get to the specifics of why Republicans are, want to deny people health care or close our border or end aid to poor people or make children suffer. I mean, you heard that they want to cancel the Special Olympics even? Really? Really? Ask yourself who you are. What are your values? Do you believe in a world where people help one another? Do you believe it takes a village to raise a child? Or are you only about yourself? Are you like Donald Trump? This is Mark Levine. We're going to take one more break. We'll be right back right after this. Hey, Mark, so the reason I didn't come in on time is because um, I had turned all the sound off from the commercial breaks. But it looks like Facebook can't hear that sound. So that works when I do a show like today without callers, but it probably wouldn't work when we have callers. So we'll need to work that out. So anyway, folks, um, we will be back for a very short segment. I hope you've enjoyed um, the show back today. And thank you, Rafe, um, for giving ideas. I disagree with you, but I do appreciate ideas rather than insults. But, Ray, I want you to think about what you said. You said um, the Second Amendment was designed to defend against a government no longer controlled by the people. Think about that, again, that level of paranoia, right? Um, the checks and balances were designed to protect us from a runaway government. But as Frank Cota said, yeah, the gun can't defend you against a tank. That's right. They didn't have tanks in 1776. That's true, Ray. So do you think we need tanks now? I mean – if the goal is to have citizens be able to take over the government, the only way I know how we're going to be able to do that is to give everyone nuclear access to nuclear weapons. Because even if I have a tank, if they got nukes, I still can't beat them with my tank. So should everybody be able to have dirty bombs? Is that what you're advocating, Ray? Or do you recognize that maybe the Second Amendment doesn't apply to today's situation?
So we'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Oh, that worked. Mark, I think you did that, and that's good. Now, the trick is to make sure that the music – it is better, Mark. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm talking to my producer. That's what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not crazy. We're at a commercial break and I'm just talking with my producer, Facebook listeners. We'll be back in a minute. Um, but, um, yes, it's much better. Yes, yes, yes. Except I need music when we come back. All right. So we're almost done. You know, it's funny. I never really know where um, where I'm going to go. I didn't really know I was going to talk about guns. But it kind of illustrates my point, the one about fear. You know, I'll talk more about it when I get back on the air. But um, I really think you're a happier person. That's what I'm going to get to. I think you're a happier person if you – realize that most people aren't trying to harm you. I think it makes you happier. Well, well, I'll close on that point. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. Just a few minutes left, talking about conservative and liberal philosophy and really trying to bring it down to the emotional level because we use all these logical arguments back and forth, and maybe it convinces some people at the margins. But I think we all know that at the heart of what makes a Republican or a Democrat, a conservative or a liberal, it has to do with your gut. It doesn't have to do so much with logic. Most people aren't reasoning logically, and I don't say that as a good thing. I wish they would. I'm a big fan of logic. I think the heart of the question is when you see a complete stranger, do you think, hey, that looks like an interesting person. That person's kind of cool. Wonder what they're all about. Or where's my purse? Where's my wallet? Are they going to harm me? And here's the thing. People, some people are out to harm you. No doubt about it. There are dangerous, evil people in the world. But I'm here to say they're a very tiny minority. 99 out of 100, 999 out of 1,000 people you meet are good people, just like you, trying to get along in this difficult world, just like you. They love their family or their friends. They have lives. Maybe they have kids. Maybe they're trying to go to school. Maybe they're trying to keep a job. Maybe their heart got broken. Maybe they have some disease. Maybe they're caring for a loved one. They're like you. They live. They love. They learn. They make mistakes. Most people aren't evil. I'm not denying that evil exists, but most people aren't. And that means... If you're at a restaurant and someone is sitting next to you at the next table, they're probably just trying to eat their meal. If someone is walking by you on a path in the park, they're probably a good person. And they may not be. And if people aren't acting nice to you, you're under no obligation to act nice to them. And if someone tries to grab your wallet, you know, run. Or if, but. If you're constantly worried about everyone attacking you, think what it does to you. You may catch that one in a thousand person who's trying to do you harm. You may. But in the meantime, you're making your life and the 999 people you mistrust miserable. If you live life like you're going to be attacked any moment, if I didn't join the House of Delegates because someone could take a shot at me, and they could. If I was afraid to speak on air because I was afraid someone might do me harm, that would harm me. You have a right to be you. 
You have a right to live. We're on this world 70, 80, 90, 100 years if we're really lucky. And if we live all those lives in fear and hate and misery and saying, this is mine, this is mine. My great-grandparents came here to escape oppression, but your great-grandparents can come here to escape oppression. Mine were Irish or Italian or Jewish and yours, they're Latino. And what's the difference? If you follow the golden rule and treat others as you treat yourself, number one, you're probably a liberal. Number two, you probably have a little bit of compassion and someone's in trouble. And if you give compassion to others, well, karma says you might get a little compassion back. You spread a little kindness in the world, you might get some kindness back. And isn't that the world we want to live in, rather than a world that's rent by hatred and fear? Don't vote your fears this November or next November, folks. Vote your hopes and your dreams. Those are the ones that most all the world shares. This is Mark Levine, signing off. Talk to you next week. All right, I'm going to sign out here. Goodbye, Facebook. Talk to you next week.